Okay. So welcome everybody. Um, Dr. David Popley, I'm from Wake Forest Baptist Health. Um, I'm joined today by uh, my co-facilitator, Dr. Kathleen Davenport from Hospital for Special Surgery in Florida. Uh, we're joined today by some very distinguished colleagues. Uh, we have uh, Kristen Fentroy, who's a soloist of Boston Ballet. We have uh, Russell Kaiser, who's the assistant artistic director for Boston Ballet, and Dr. Lyle McKaylee from Boston Children's Hospital, uh, and also the McKaylee Center for Stress Injury Prevention. The purpose of today's webinar is to discuss the communication between dancers and healthcare professionals, in part to find places where we have common ground, where we may share terminology, um, talking about injury, and also talking about opportunities um, for dancers to improve their communication with physicians, physicians to uh, improve their communication with dancers, and just, and just gain experience and stories from each other. So um, if it's okay, I'd like to start the discussion with a question for Dr. McKaylee. Uh, and Dr. McKaylee, I just, I guess one of my questions for you is how did you initially get drawn into dance medicine? Well, we were the first sports medicine clinic in Boston in 1974. And, uh, some of the dancers started coming to us individually uh, to, for their problems and, and injuries and so forth. And as an example, and in 1974, the standard of care for a sprained ankle was six weeks in a plaster walking cast. And you can't do that, of course, to a dancer, or even an elite athlete. And so we, our approach was more functional and dynamic and the dancers appreciated that. And then uh, after about a year, we started a more formal relationship with the uh, Boston Ballet I would go down to the ballet and cover performances and observe uh, classes. And uh, Arlene Wallacek, our therapist at that time, would, would go down and cover the ballet uh, on site at the ballet. And then she, of course, was the, the godmother of Heather, uh, who are, is our physical therapist uh, director at Boston Ballet now. And it basically, it was a two-way street. We were learning about the special problems that dancers get uh, in the course of injury. On the other hand, we could share with them what we'd learned about the repetitive training and the athletes and of course acute traumatic injuries also but the our artist the, the the dancer of course has a, di a different dimension an additional dimension uh the aesthetic component uh and uh one of our dancers once said to me that her her body was her instrument so we're, the physician dealing with dancers has to appreciate that also and of course the, the special high level and intensity and volume of training in dancers. They might be performing a classic piece uh, on Saturday, but through the rest of the previous week, they're doing a contemporary uh, rehearsals for a forthcoming ballet. And that combination can sometimes be a problem. Uh, in addition, in dealing with our student doctors, we had to teach them the different kinds of problems dancers can have about the hip, about the foot and ankle, knee and so forth. They have a they have different problems, and sometimes they have a need for different approaches to these problems, as opposed to the athlete. So I think one of the things that you know I hear Dr. McKaylee saying is certainly there's some there's some overlap for dancers looking like a sort of quote unquote traditional competition athlete, uh, but there are also some some new considerations. And I, Dr. McKaylee, I guess just to follow up on one of the things you were talking about um, is. What do you think makes dance medicine? Why does that need to sort of be its own subset of sports medicine? Well, because in, in many cases, in many instances, the, 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 there's a different set of diagnoses that you do not encounter in, in the athlete. Uh, in the classical ballet dancer, uh, they might have five different causes of pain in the back of the ankle, one of which would be ostrigonum impingement, posterior impingement, flexor halsus, longus problems and so forth, which you rarely, if ever, encounter in the athletic population. Occasionally in soccer players, they might have some posterior impingement. By and large, they often have unique problems that you have to learn about uh, to appreciate what their differential diagnosis is and how, as a first step, of course, in, in treating them effectively and successfully. And I wanted to also ask Ms. Fentroy and Mr. Kaiser, in terms of your perspectives from coming in as well to a healthcare provider, how do you think of yourself in the broadest sense? Do you think of yourself artist, athlete, artist, athlete? Can you speak on that? All of the above. Yeah, I think artist, <laughs> athlete is a great way to say it um, because we're definitely artists first, but we are very athletic. 
And can you talk about how your view of your profession has changed in time? Yeah, um, I think as I got further into my profession, uh, I started to understand the physicality of it and um, how it's not just creating pretty pictures and pretty movements and pictures and all of these things. There's so much more that goes into it. I have to have a really good understanding of my body and the way that it moves and what its limitations are or are not. Yeah, I think every dancer starts off in a very physical, athletic way, building building a technique. But as you grow and mature, the artistry is when it really comes in and you're able to utilize what you've worked so hard for for so long. And when you talk to others about what you do, what kind of language do you use with them? I know it's a hard question. You know. It is a hard question. It is a hard question. Because it's, it's both because, you know, we're in the business of moving people and bringing people to the theater and changing their lives in many ways. But there's also an incredible athletic part of it that it's what really kind of gives a lot of people a great impact, especially when they come into the studio and they watch these beautiful dancers work every day. I like to remind people that oftentimes a lot of athletes go to ballet classes to help tune their personal instruments um, to make them stronger and help make their bodies a little bit uh, faster or more agile. Um, so to help people that maybe aren't dancers or aren't super athletic uh, understand what goes into what we have to do. And talk to me a little bit about, you know, this, the way that you express yourself within your profession and how you express it to others within the field of medicine, you know, communicating with providers, with your physical therapist, with, with your doctor, you know, how that changes or informs those types of medical communications as well. Um, <laughs> Go ahead, Kirsten. No, please. <laughs> well, I was gonna, you know, speak from my current role, not from when I was a, a dancer a very, very long time ago, but. I think of it as a collaboration. You know, I work with Heather and Dr. McKaylee and the rest of our medical team. And, you know, every time a dancer sits in my office and we're talking through getting them back on stage or into the studio, it's about, it's a real collaboration and understanding of, of what their ultimate goal is. I agree with that 100%. I think that, that it is totally a collaborative effort. I can't say it better. <laughs> <laughs> And I, that kind of brings us to the next question. This always uh, touch probably again. Um, this will be a question for both Ms. Ventro as well as Mr. Kaiser. So one of the things I think that can be challenging as a physician to work with dancers is what what they mean when they say the word injury, right? I think what I might think of as injury and how you all might define injury are a little bit different. You know, for a lot of reasons, dancers kind of live with pain, they often aren't functioning at what they consider to be 100%. So I guess for both of you, um, for your, from your respective roles, what do you all mean when you use the word injured? You I get think, to go first this time, Kirsten. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think um, from, from my perspective, I call myself injured. I don't like to call myself injured unless I'm unable to dance or my dancing is limited. Um, otherwise I'm dancing with pain. <laughs> um, so for me, injury is labeled for it for when, I, when I'm unable to do what I usually do on a daily basis. Um, but I think that that changes depending on each dancer and their tolerance to pain, how much they are in pain with their body, how much um, they are used to pushing through pain. I think it has to do with their Sometimes they're training and, and whether or not they've been kind of taught to ignore these minor pains, um, things like that. And do you feel like most dancers are on the same page as you? I mean, do you feel like most dancers define injury the same way? I think that, uh, I think that a lot of dancers are afraid to use the word that they're injured. Um, I think that something that a lot of dancers struggle with is their identity and their identity outside of dancing. So if you take dance away from them, they don't know who they are. So they don't want to say that they're injured. They don't want to lose their ability to dance. Um, and so I think that that really does vary from dancer to dancer. Some dancers uh, bruise their toenails and won't put on their point shoes, um, but other dancers will bruise all their toenails and will keep dancing. <laughs> so I think it really, it really varies. 
Yeah, it really, it really does from dancer to dancer. I don't, I think I agree with Kirsten. If somebody can't like do their job, like come to a studio and work, that's really when we consider them truly injured. I mean, like you said, we're always dealing with something um, and we work around that. And sometimes we have to make modifications throughout the day or the week, but, but we can still work, but hopefully we have them in the studio. And for both of you collectively, who is your first go-to person when you, when you finally decide there is maybe an injury? <laughs> Who's the first person you're notifying? Is that, is that uh, the physical therapist? Is that the dance instructor? Who, who are you usually talking with first? I usually go to Heather first. I consult with myself first, and then I will go to Heather. <laughs> and so what changes, when do you decide you might want to be going to a doctor? Is that a continued pain issue? Is that a performance problem? Is that Heather telling you that you need to go? What sort of is that trigger for you to seek, seek care from a physician next? It's a combination of all of them. Um, at the end of the day, you have to be realistic with what your body is telling you. And if you have a pain that is either getting worse or not going away for a long period of time, it's time to have someone else look at it. Um, that's usually where Heather also is, is, is the one saying like, it's time for you to go. Um, and she'll also be the person that, that'll that look at it for the first time and be like, this is bad enough that you need to go now. Yeah. And that brings me to bringing in Heather. So so Ms. Southwick, uh, which is very funny for me to call you that since we know each other well, <laughs> um, formally on here. Um, I, you oftentimes can be the first person that many dancers in Boston Ballet see, but then you also have a unique role of sometimes being an intermediary and a great advocate in between position and dancer as well. And so sometimes you can be really the quarterback of the medical team. So when you're communicating, talk to me about some of the language that you use around saying like what an injury means and how that might language might change based on whether you're talking to Dr. McKaylee or one of your dancers. Um, I think, you know, it sort of depends on how they're describing it as well. So, you know, injury definition is sort of the question of the hour, right? We're all going to describe it differently at different times. And um, as both Kirsten and, and Russell said, dancers will have a certain tolerance for dancing with pain and with issues. Um, my mantra is always, you can't walk, it, it's time. You can't dance. <laughs> um, and sometimes they really need to reinforce that because it's, you know, can be an issue. I am fortunate in my setting that I am able to see people sort of frontline and can see them for prevention as well. So a lot of education goes into it with the dancers. Sometimes some education goes into it with the physicians as well. As Dr. McKaylee um, suggested, we have uh, fellows from sports medicine that will often come and learn about dance medicine and sort of some of the unique intricacies and differences between treating dancers and the athletes that they might see generally in clinic or in their other affiliations with colleges. Um, and so that really can be helpful too to sort of help them understand how to translate the language to a degree. Um, so again, we're, we're fortunate that I can see things frontline and I can also hear and follow it for a little bit. It's not like I get a one snapshot view, unless the injury is obviously acute. So we can track things, see how it's responding to different kinds of treatments and then decide when it makes sense. We're also super fortunate that we just have, I call it the bat phone, but we have a company okay. physician. I have Dr. McKaylee. I, ha I have the ability to speak to a physician um, at any time when I need. And that is really, really helpful. And what do you look for in terms of yellow flags and red flags? You already spoke like you can't walk, you can't dance. It's hilarious. I use that phrase. So I, it's, <laughs> maybe I picked it up from you at some point. I probably did. Um, but what other things do you look at for yellow flags and red flags? I think some of the red flags are certainly how long has this been going on? Um, what is the kind of pain? You know, is this bone pain or, or pain that is becoming, it shouldn't be pushed through. You know, it, it, again, it comes down to education. There is some pain that dancers need to learn is dangerous to be pushing through. And um, when you're in a professional company, it's you are 
are help, it is helpful that you have that direct access so we can hopefully recognize problems early and then mitigate how big an issue becomes and maybe even mitigate it full, you know, turning into a full blown injury where someone can't be doing their job, as Russell said. Um, another red flag Dr. McKaylee knows is I get particularly cranky when someone is not responding to my treatment. Um, anyone who knows me knows I'm very type A perfectionist. I do well with the, the company setting because we're all the same. And so if they're not, if, if their body isn't cooperating the way I think it should be, even given all the challenges that they're constantly doing the stimulus that is creating the injury, um, that's also when I might show up and, and sometimes even come with the dancer because I'm not understanding why things don't make sense. So we have to have more of a team dialogue with the physician, the dancer, um, and me to sort of get through that issue. That's yellow a, flags. Um, I'm sorry, go ahead. Finish yeah, yeah. Up, sorry. I think yellow flags, again, some persistent pain. Um, you know, maybe we're modifying things that's still not working. Or as we build up, like Russell knows, sometimes as we're looking at what's coming, we have to see like the dancer is about to go into this very intense time of performing. If this pain isn't working out while we're trying to modify, it may only get worse. And that's kind of also a yellow flag. Like let's take this opportunity when we can to deal with what's going on and not allow it to get worse. So again, we're lucky because we have that kind of constant care and discourse that we can make those decisions. So I was going to say that this makes a really nice segue over to Dr. McKaylee as well, which is, um, you know, Dr. McKelly, when you are seeing patients coming over from Heather and from Boston Ballet, or when you're seeing other dancers in the clinic, when are you typically seeing them in terms of their injury trajectory? Well, it depends on the type of injury. In, in acute traumatic injuries, we're often in, in seeing them the same day or so. We, make, we always make room in our schedule for our dancers. Uh, acute overuse injuries, a slow progressive onset of problems, and Heather has, has outlined very well what uh, what, what troubles her and what prompts her to refer people on. I would like to put a plug in for having an on-site physical therapist. Uh, we have published two articles on this and the benefits of it. Uh, Ruth Solomon worked with us on this. Basically, we showed that it was obviously a great benefit to the dancers, but also to the dance companies. It, made, it paid for itself and, and it actually uh, really helped decrease the number of injuries that we saw uh, by catching them early in many instances preventing them from becoming a, a difficult problem. So if at all possible if you're with your dance companies, try to get an on-site physical therapy for continuity of care in particular and early recognition of problems. And I know it, it probably varies based on the level of dancer you're seeing in terms of his or her experience level or where they are in their respective careers. But how are you finding, how are dancers generally describing their injuries to you? Are they talking anatomical terms? Are they using artistic terms or performance terms? Well, sometimes a com combination of all of the above. They'll say they have a certain problem with an arabesque, uh, some low back pain with an arabesque, or they'll, they'll, they'll basically uh, start driving a, a pain, a click that started out painless in the hip and now has become painful and where it is exactly. And, uh, dancers want to continue dancing. I think that everyone has, has made, paid tribute to that. Dancers want to continue dancing, hopefully effectively and without a, a increased crescendos of pain. But I think they're often your best friend. But I would say, hey, one thing that I've learned over the year with dancers is that I ask them whether they think they can dance. And they, where I'm, I go down and I'm asked to see a dancer and, and, and they have a performance that night. And part of my uh, important information is when I ask them, because I don't know what the exact specific demands of that particular role are. And I think I found that very helpful over the years to get the dancer's opinion about the, whether they think can or cannot dance. And how accurate do you feel like that perception generally is? I think it's, all, it's usually very accurate. I think the dancer, is, is, again, they, they have a common denominator. They want to dance. And, and uh, sometimes Russell is put in the middle. <laughs> we, we, we spring that on him <laughs> when the, uh, at 7.15. <laughs> and for his seven challenge, Dr. McKaylee. <laughs> in terms of comparison to other athletes, um, what is your perception of sort of a dancer's, the dancer's ability to sort of uh, perceive their own injury and then how do they adjust to getting that diagnosis versus maybe some other athlete groups that you've worked with? 
Yeah, I, I think that generally they, it, it's a matter of confidence. If they think you you are sympathetic to their their goals, their personal goals, and and, and you know about Dan's injuries, you're, you're ha basically have had experience. You know, we don't we all get a good judgment from experience with bad judgment, and unfortunately. But anyway, I think it's a, it's it's a sense of confidence, as with any patient. Does the patient have confidence in you and your motivation and your goals and and uh, what your priorities are <clears throat> we're uh, are you prioritizing them versus the company versus yourself and so forth and dr mckaylee i have a question i have been i've heard from other doctors um who take care of traditional what we call traditional athletes you know basketball football um over artistic athletes i had one doctor who i heard a conference say um, it's our job as doctors to protect the athlete from themselves. In other words, that they're just going to go dance or they're just going to go do things. And so with that, you know, I, I have found in, in dancers, it, it's not, they tend to be a little bit more in tune to their bodies, but I, I would love to hear your opinion on that quote. Yeah, I think in some cases that is, uh, that is what you're dealing with, uh, you, you, particularly with the, I think in, in the case of younger dancers, younger athletes, we are to a certain extent in local parentis and we have to think in the long term, what's their, what's their, their knee gonna be like when they're 47 and so forth. So yeah, I think you have to inject that aspect of it. But I think it's a two way street. I think that you get to, as you get to know an individual dancer better, you have a sense of where they throw up the red flag and, and when they should throw up the red flag and perhaps don't. And, and, but I think it's a, it's a dynamic. Yeah, it's a good answer. Um, I wanted to open it up to Dr. McKaylee, also adding in Ms. Southwick, talking about taking a medical dance history or a medical history from dancers, how that might differ from a non-dancer patient, whether that's an athlete, you know, vocabulary, vocabulary for the body, description of the body, how they're describing the, their sport and their activities. What are some tips if we had, let's say, a physical therapist or a doctor that says, I want to see dancers, what are a few tips that you would say, these are some things that you might hear or see, and, and this is what I've learned that you should know? Yeah, I think that you learn from your patients, of course, in, in a lot of the instances, but I think that in the case of dance, in particularly classical dance, uh, it really helps to do some additional reading about dance as a discipline. And then you begin to understand the, the first position versus the fourth position and, and so forth. And that does help you hone in your, in many cases, your diagnosis uh, when dealing with the dancer and communicating with them. Yeah, I would say I would agree com completely in terms of vocabulary. Like if you have learned some of the vocabulary, then it's going to help you be able to speak the language. So if a dancer can say to you, I have pain when I do a plie, you don't know what a plie is, it's kind of difficult to understand what they're talking about. Um, I think also, certainly at the professional level, but I've seen this very much so, it's the same in college level dancers and different kinds of students. Dancers tend to have, as we've already said, a really good um, understanding of their own body and can be super knowledgeable. And sometimes, actually, this can be misleading because they can come in and say, I have tendinitis. Yeah. and tell you what the diagnosis is and um, really have to sort of pull out some of that information and really educate them uh, as well. And it can be hard for them to describe their pain accurately. So I always find um, it's very interesting, again, working with the sports medicine and helping them hone their evaluation skills. I often hear from them that evaluating a dancer is a lot harder because sometimes it's very difficult to reproduce the pain clinically. So they have to really get down to the function of it. And again, it comes back to knowing the vocabulary and understanding what they have to do. You know, what are they requiring in terms of their function? And any specific pearls or maybe missteps in, the, in your careers, you both have been with working with dancers in general in Boston Ballet specifically um, for, for such an amazing length of time. Any pearls that you're like, oh my word, definitely do this, or any, any fun little missteps that we should definitely avoid for anyone maybe earlier in their career, one of the pearls that, that you're saying, by the way, what about this? Well, I think that uh, what, the more you get to know the dancer, the whole dancer, the whole person, I think the better you can be hone in sometimes on making a proper diagnosis and effective treatment and uh, 
certainly that in dancers, there's a strong emotional component, uh, psychological aspects. A, a dance company, they're, they're basically all uh, friends and very supportive of each other, yet they're actively competing for roles. And so there's that competitive aspect. Uh, I think it's very stressful. I think it's a very stressful career and uh, it's very demanding. It, it certainly rivals anything I've seen in professional athletes. Yeah, I would say, um, you know, there's that psychological overlay that's on everything, right? And um, sometimes we're all the best at den denial, myself included, you know, so sometimes I'm having trouble even recognizing how significant the injury is because I know it's this person's opportunity to go on opening night in the principal role. And it can be hard to remove yourself even and be really objective. Um, so I would say that's one of my missteps. Um, and you really make sure you've established that trust. As Dr. McKaylee was talking about, you know, there's so many ways to kind of do that with both understanding the vocabulary as well as what are the demands on their job. Um, but it can make it really challenging to sort of get through that denial and even the fear, right? That as Kirsten was talking about, there's a lot of fear around being injured. And so sometimes you have to work a little bit more to get the information um, that you need, more than you would you would anticipate. I always joke, my double major in college was dance and psychology, and everyone says, which one was more important than what you do now? <laughs> we know the answer to that. <laughs> I can still dance. <laughs> I want to flip it over. Um, Dr. Pauli is going to ask some more questions to bring in the, the, art, the artistic side as well to talk about some similar questions, um, but also from, from the other side as well. Yeah, that was, that was a, a great lead. Thanks, Kathleen. So um, Kirsten and Russell, I wanted to get your thoughts on when you have seen a medical professional, what has been your experience in terms of their ability to take your medical history? Um, I think I think the hardest part about like going to a doctor about an injury that you're just starting to talk about is actually articulating exactly what you want them to hear. Um, like Heather was talking about, we, are, we, we sometimes have this idea that we know what it is, um, but we wouldn't be at the doctor's office if, if we knew what it was. Uh, ultimately, we would have the solution ourselves. Um, and sometimes you just want to explain exactly what you're feeling, um, but you don't know the terms to towards like this is what I what hurts, and this is where inside my body it hurts. Like it's not just my whole ankle. I know it's not a sprain, but I know something's wrong there. Um, but you can't like articulate the way that you can feel it in your body. Um, I think that's where like being in tune with your body gets kind of frustrating sometimes because you know something's wrong but you don't know what it is and and like Heather was talking about sometimes you can't reproduce it when you need to um, but you know it's there. Um, I think I might have veered off of your question but I hope I answered it to some degree. <laughs> and we we touched on it a little bit before but it also depends on the dancer right because here's Kirsten who's experienced and she's she's learned a lot about herself but the younger dancers, we have to watch out for a lot more because they just haven't had the time or the, or the experience or the injuries. Um, first time somebody gets injured is really difficult for them to um, manage their way through it. And we can't underestimate the emotional content, um, especially in the beginning of your career when you could really benefit from knowing more um, mm -hmm. to get through those times, it's really hard. So can you describe an instance where you, either of you have seen a physician and that person's done a particularly a good job in terms of um, both gathering the medical history, but also sort of addressing that psychological component? Maybe give us an example of someone, a, a physician story, you can remember going, an encounter going really well and saying, man, I really like that doctor because X. Um, <laughs> we lost her. Am I frozen? Oh no. Maybe too much of a leading question, but. <laughs> <laughs> oh no. It's just your video, Kirsten. Can you hear me? Yeah, Kirsten, we can still hear you. Great, so I'll just keep talking and hopefully my, my computer froze. So, um, 
Uh, I think that I can speak like from something that I'm dealing with right now. Um, I had uh, an ongoing injury that was going on and. Uh, uh oh. Uh, Heather, um, being able to articulate what I was dealing with and um, having her understand the frustration of not knowing everything that was going on um, and then extending that relationship to Dr. McBailey um, and having him and her together understand and deal with how I was feeling, how this was going to affect the rest of my year uh, with the company and the performances that were coming up. Um, I think that this is just a perfect example of, of a good relationship. You know, it's, it's been a long time since I danced or had a dance related injury, but I did have an injury recently and I had an amazing experience um, with Dr. Ramapa and I was only getting a second opinion and it was, there was incredible value, you know, for a second opinion, he sat with me for like 45 minutes and only talked through all of the options and the pros and cons of all the different scenarios. And I think, um, you know, I have, I have dancers that sit with me and they're having trouble navigating through maybe what some of their treatment plans might be and to have that the value of that time was um, I think it can be really important to somebody making the right choice. Did we lose Kirsten? I don't I we may have. Kirsten, if you can hear us, Bill, we'll 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 continue on and you can rejoin us at any time that is convenient for you. Um, I guess as a follow-up to that question are there things that you can remember where there was a particular instance that something really did not go well or didn't sit well with you um, either if you had an injured dancer or you were that you were the person coming to the doctor um, something that just didn't sit well or some, some communication failure that you can remember not not i don't have anything specific kirsten might when she joins back with us but yeah, i think I let her in the waiting room she's waiting no, oh, I'll, I'll bring her back in. in. Perfect. Sorry, Russell. No, I, just to finish up, I it's kind of the reverse of, of my last story, which is really if somebody feels rushed or pushed through and uninformed, um, like, okay, well, this is wrong and this is what we're going to do. And, and they don't feel really educated or informed. I think every opportunity we have to educate someone on their injury and what they might be dealing with will only help inform them on how to deal with things moving forward. Welcome back. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, and I guess that that might plug in well to where Kathleen's going with with some questions regarding um, how, how to tell a dancer to stop. Yeah, so Dr. McKayla, we want to put you in the hot seat just a little bit and of those difficult conversations that you're very good at with your dancers. Um, when, when I think I, I personally in my clinic get my dancers very fearful to come in because they're afraid I'm gonna tell them to stop dancing. And so sometimes we, we see them late, not in the professional setting, but maybe when they don't have an on-site physical therapist or athletic trainer who's taking care of them, but out in the community, but sometimes there are injuries that they're, they're no-go injuries. So what, what, are the, what are the absolute no injuries that a dancer comes in and you're like, I know, it's, it, 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 is, it is no, we must stop. Well, it's certainly a, a problem in, of certain types of, almost in any joint where you, they, you've lost range of motion, uh, you're having uncontrolled swelling of the joint, uh, concerns about uh, some of the special stress fractures that dancers get in the foot and ankle, for instance, which often can become very insidious. And the longer they're put off as far as treatment, the more difficult it is to treat them effectively. And so I'm always, and when I, I have a young dancer come in, say from a college group or something like this, <clears throat> or a small company, small contemporary company, I, I'm, my, my suspicions are up because I know they haven't had someone like Heather working with them. Uh, and, I, and, I, and I'm sort of looking for the, the potential hidden problems that they may have been working around or dancing around, but are not going to help them as far as their health in the long run. 
And then what do you do with a major midseason injury? Like, like Ms. Southwick was saying, you know, we were ready to go on. They finally got the principal role. We're getting ready. It's opening night. It's 715. And then all of a sudden we're like, oh, pause. You know, there's, there's a major concern. What does that conversation look like so that you as a doctor are doing the right thing as a doctor by that injury and by that dancer, but yet having these hard conversations with the whole team? How, how are you a good team player in that situation? Well, it's, it's very difficult because, of course, you're, you're, you're working with dancers because you like dance. You like to see performances and you like ballets and so forth and so on. But yet, I think that that's where you have to really take the the personal uh, best interest of the individual kid you're dealing with. And it helps to have had experience and, you know, been working with a company for 30 or 40 years and you've gotten perspective from dealing with other dancers where perhaps you didn't make the right recommendation. And so uh, it's a very difficult and uh, striking thing to tell a, a, a dancer and in the situation, for instance, where Heather has cited that they can't go on and play and have that that role and we all see that in Nutcracker right where the younger kids get a chance to get a, a better role in Nutcracker and uh, then unfortunately have some kind of an injury and it can be very trying and I think that, uh, that it's difficult for everybody and uh, I think it's a matter of uh, basically as Russell said spending some time on making them understand that you appreciate what a bad thing this is for them but on the other hand the best thing in their their long-term best interest is to not dance that night. And then how, what kind of language do you use? So you have this moment where you're talking to the dancer, the artistic director, the therapist, you're talking to the team, the dancers in your office, maybe you have Heather with you in the office as well. Maybe you have Russell on speakerphone, you know, maybe everyone's together as a team or maybe it's different language. What kind of language do you use with this team that is very dance specific for this artistic athlete so that they can join you with this treatment plan when we're in this difficult moment? Well, I think that you have to put it in perspective. You have to basically, if you have, don't have a good understanding at that time of what, ro what role they're looking at or what role they've been proposed, I think you have to learn that. And basically that's where the support people we have at the ballet is very helpful. I think that uh, I certainly don't know the details of every ballet and, uh, and really, it's 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 a team decision in many cases. I think that you don't you're not going to be opposing a, a, a decision. In some ways, we have professional guidelines. If a dancer gets a concussion, which fortunately is rare, but it can happen. And we've actually written an article about that. But basically, I and mean, in that situation, you you have to say, well, we cannot really professionally let you go on stage because you've had a concussion. But unfortunately, a lot of the other problems that dancers have are not that black and white and that sometimes there is a, a, a fuzz fudge factor so it's a it's a t very difficult area of, of, to make a decision and then we're gonna i'm gonna have david flip it over to the dancer and artistic side as well to, to you're not off the hook these are the, right. <laughs> so we have the dr mckaylee facing side and i guess it's it, <laughs> i'd like to hear from from russell and from kirsten what your experiences have been when either as an artistic director, you have heard the, you have had to hear from someone like Dr. McKaylee, okay, we need to talk about either modifying dance or discontinuing dance or Kirsten, what your experience might be um, on an episode where you may have had been, been told to stop dancing. What were, what was your position's approach and sort of what were your reflections on that? Well, I think we're really lucky. I mean, look at the team that we have. So, like when I'm being told that when Heather's telling me that somebody can't dance, <laughs> there's, there's really no question most of the time. I mean, there's so many different scenarios, right? Concussion is an excellent example, right? There's no question. We're not taking that risk. And then there's a whole realm of diff other injuries that might cause a larger conversation based on what that dancer is trying to do. But at the end of the day, none of us want anybody to do anything that is going to compromise them moving forward and having a fulfilling career, right? Whether it's, you know, sometimes it's just, we're usually we're having just got, I need a few days and hopefully that will resolve us and we'll be back on track. 
then it's dealing with the psychological side of somebody who may have lost their opportunity. Um, but the fact that we have this team together and we're able to have those conversations is a great gift. Kirtan, don't, don't. Uh, <laughs> You're on the spot here. Tonight. I pretend to freeze. Um, <laughs> I think that I'm I'm the kind of dancer that um, is guilty of of pushing things to the last minute. Um, will try to work my way through injury um, as best I can, not necessarily for the sake of opportunity, just because I don't like to let people down. Um, I have a really hard time feeling like someone else has to do the work for me now that I'm last minute injured or um, feeling like I've let the artistic staff down or something like that. That's something that I've struggled with for a long time. But I also think that I'm lucky enough to be far enough in my career that I understand those emotions and I know when to turn them off. Um, I think it's super helpful to have people, again, that, that you can trust, They're, that they aren't trying to take you out of something um, for no reason other than for the benefit of your own self and your body. Um, I think that uh, you really need to understand that the people that are helping you are trying to help you. Um, so I think the dancer, from the dancer side, it's just having that trust and understanding that nobody's going to tell you not to dance unless you need to not dance. They're not trying to take anything away from you. So in your experience, what, how has that discussion been framed that's been um, like what sort of language do you want do you want to hear? I know we talked about what sort of language Dr. McKayla uses with his dancers. What kind of language do you want your doctor to be using with you to, to help you feel like that discussion might be a little bit easier? I think for me it's it's always a little bit of a light bulb when when they talk big picture more. Um, remind me that it's not about, or remind the dancer that it's not about the next performance that you're doing, but about the next 20 performances that you're going to be doing and the performances that are going to be in the years to come. Um, it's really easy to get caught up in what's happening right in front of you right now. And I think that being reminded that sometimes if you push through something now, it can last a lot longer later. Um, I think that's, that's the easiest language for me to hear and for me to kind of swallow my pride, I guess, um, and and sit down. Yeah. Uh, on occasion, I don't know how, how uh, Dr. Davenport and Dr. Michaela feel about this, but on occasion when I have been talking to dancers in clinic, sometimes I'll talk about injury as being a, a learning opportunity, that you know, it may be hard to see that right now. And, and of course it may require a little bit of time away from your sport, um, but there's, it's not all that often that injury happens, you know, just in a vacuum. There are freak accidents, of course, but often it is an opportunity to look over things like biomechanics and um, training load and sort of how, how you're taking care of yourself physically and, and emotionally. How yeah. would you respond to that type of discussion? I, I totally agree with that statement. Um, from injuries that I've had in the past, I remember coming back and being feeling like I was a better dancer after the injury than I was before, because I actually was forced to take the time to work on the things that I was weak in, the areas that I was weak in. So I think that that's a really valid point. Um, and there are more ways of using it as a learning experience than just physically. It's um, um, you know emotionally, you come out on the under, on the other end stronger, and with the experience of knowing how to handle an injury differently. Um, you also have the time to learn other things and hone in on other activities that you might like to do outside of dance, which is good for your mental health. Um, and, and it's good to, to give your body a rest and, and understanding that is important. And that's a good segue to talking about, um, I wanted to throw it back to Southwick and McKaylee about how to keep dancers active while they're injured. Um, before we transition fully to that, I did want to hear from Southwick if you had anything to add on these more catastrophic or larger injuries when the dancer has to be fully out. Because I think sometimes you, I wouldn't call you a middleman, but sometimes you might have you know, the doctor on one side, artistic here. Yeah, I like quarterback, maybe more than middle middleman, you know, as, as a role, but kind of how do you navigate when we have this dancer at the at the center here and all these factors going on around yeah i mean it can be really challenging <laughs> because you know you have the information the news is not good sometimes 
Russell sees me and he says, I don't want to see you. I don't want to know what you're going to tell me. I just don't want to. But of course- okay, With know, all the love in the world, Heather. Exactly. <laughs> um, again, you know, we're lucky to work as a team and the dancer is a huge part of that team. And we really try to talk a lot about the fear of not communicating. That when you don't communicate with your artistic staff, um, you often will cause yourself more issues than if you do. And of course, you know, we're careful. They know I can, the dancers know I can be a vault and I'll keep their information um, quiet, not just within the realms of the law, but also personal confidentiality. Um, but there's a time where we really have a conversation that it, it's time to communicate. And if you communicate, it's going to help a lot. Um, so that's a big factor. And I think when we get into that and we are all kind of sitting down to discuss what needs to happen with someone, um, it can be helpful. And sometimes with young dancers, and Russell and I have talked a lot about this as well as with our artistic director, Miko, we we'll really kind of push them to do that communication on their own. Um, you know, I say to them, your mom doesn't, my mom doesn't call in sick for me. <laughs> there is a point where as a professional, you have to learn to do that and you have to learn to advocate for yourself and the coping and the resilience and some of the things that Kirsten was talking about, as well as that advocating is really part of, you know, having an injury and learning to deal with that. So sometimes I find I'm helping coach them and this is how you do that because everyone's going to have a sick day. Everyone's going to have an issue that they need to um, take a step back for whatever reason. And again, it comes down to education and then a lot of pep talk. And that's you, you brought up a really good point. And, and Russell, you also mentioned this before of talking about kind of like a first injury and learning how to be injured, you know, and what are, I'll throw this out to all four of you too, any specific lessons from personal injuries or um, from an artistic administration standpoint, having an injury come out with first injuries or from the medical standpoint, that first injury or early on in the injury career, some lessons that you would love to tell a former self or a younger dancer of like, oh, please, please do this, you know, for, for those early injuries and maybe you don't know how to be injured. I'll, I'll just start by saying, because Kirsten will have much more to add, I'm sure, but it's it's just a continuation of what we're talking about, right? They're, these young dancers come and they think it's the end of their career, that they're they're not going to get the opportunity. Here comes, you know, I'm really looking forward to this program. Giving themselves the time to to learn and heal from from what's been an unfortunate accident in their in whatever their situation was but give give yourself the time to learn it'll be the greatest gift you give yourself for the rest of your career yeah i think that that's really well said um it's just understanding that it's okay to take time away um dance careers are short but at the end of the day they are still long um you still have the time to get back to moving get back to dancing so it's important for you to talk about what your body is feeling when you start to feel it and not like talk about it when it's whispering. Don't talk about it when it starts to yell. I sometimes, um, I sometimes have a healthy story. I tell the dancers when they think the end of the world has come and they cannot not dance because of an injury. Uh, I once was in the position of having to tell Rudolf Nuria that he could not dance. <clears throat> and we had, we were facing two sold out, uh, performances and the ballet really needed the money <laughs> and so I was there I was persona non grata for a couple of days but that's the way it is yeah I mean even Nuriev and Barishnikov and every famous dancer you can think of has had an injury right so I think sometimes reminding dancers they're not alone and this is you know again part of um coping and figuring out how to turn this into an opportunity, as Kirsten said, we always try to really push that. Um, it's hard to have that perspective in the moment you get that bad news. It's hard for all of us. Like I said, even sometimes I'm in denial and I'm not fully seeing what's happening. Um, but at the same time, once you gain that perspective, that's such a valuable lesson 
that you can actually use in all parts of your life. And I think it's okay. It's important for people to know that it's okay to get upset and it's okay to be angry and to be frustrated with your physicians and with your physical therapists and whoever is delivering the bad news to you. It's okay to be angry at them for a day, but you have to, that's where the trust comes back in that you have to understand that it's coming from a good place and it's for the health of your dance career long-term. So let's take this moment where we're either fully out of it for an injury or partially out and kind of again, throwing it out to all four of you for the medical perspective, talk about what to do while a dancer is out. So specifically what modifications are okay, you know, and what types of cross training exercises can happen. And then to our dancers and artistic administration side, what do you do with adjusting performances? You know, can you adjust certain choreography? Because we know the balancing trust says no a lot of times on that. But there are times when you can adjust choreography. When when does that conversation come in and adjusting roles? So kind of modification when we're dealing with an injury that's okay to, to modify instead of being fully out. Ready, go. Yeah. <laughs> well, I would, I'll start because, you know, I constantly want people moving. I never want anyone stagnant. And I think that's one of the things that helps um, people start to deal with what's going on, right? So as much as we can possibly keep them moving safely, we do. So rest does not mean sitting on your couch and having a pity party. There is a time for that. You're allowed to do that, right, Kirsten? You can have some time for that. But and it's okay, but at the same time, you've got to move forward. And like Russell said, we're constantly trying to keep people moving forward and understand there's a bigger picture here. So making sure that we are modifying, having them move as much as possible. Every dancer, I don't care the level, even our you know youngest students. Um, if there's a hip injury, maybe you're lowering the height of your leg. If it's an injury where you shouldn't be jumping. And then that, of course, that functionality comes into casting in the roles. So that's where... I have to be very careful, especially with a strong dance background, that I'm really talking about function and not, you know, this role is easier than that role um, when I'm talking to the artistic staff, because that really doesn't matter. That's an artistic decision for them to decide in terms of casting. And our role is to say what is safe um, and what makes sense for this dancer to be able to do in a safe way, especially as Dr. McKaylee said, when the issue is gray. You know, we don't have a crystal ball, so it can be hard to really predict how something makes sense. We usually get, oh, sorry, Dr. McKaylee, please go ahead. Well, I was just saying that we have, a, we have a pretty good toolbox, more than we used to have, say, 30, 40 years ago. We have water therapy, uh, we have Pilates and gyro and so forth, and many of these can be used as part of our, our palette for getting the dancer moving and using their body, but not, not jeopardizing their the safety. I, I think that we're fortunate in that regard. We, the Burdenko water therapy program is, is located nearby, for instance. And so there are things you can do that it helps the dancer both physically and psychologically. You know, so when we get back to this, the point in their injury where we're trying to integrate them back into the studio and the work that needs to be done, that's when we usually all sit down together and go, okay, what's the plan? What's realistic? We know, we know that's a lot of gray. We know that a lot of things can change and we're prepared for that, but let's try to make a relatively realistic plan. And we can, we, we try whenever possible because we know the benefits of them being actually back in the studio. If it can be productive work and it's building towards something that's realistic, we want them back in the studio because we know the benefits of that. When it comes to modifying choreography, as you mentioned, some are more pliable than others. Um, you know, and another, another twist to the conversation is bringing somebody back to dance a role that actually injured them. Mm -hmm. So there's a whole psychological element to that. Often that happens with Nutcracker since it's the thing we repeat them all the time. Um, and we'll all be fortunate to be back to that. <laughs> Um, but we've had to deal with that. In that case, oftentimes you can make some modifications in those things, but there's a whole psychological element to bringing somebody back into either 
a specific piece of repertoire or a movement style that was actually the cause of their injury to begin with, which requires a whole other level of adapting and helping them. I think then there's also, from the dancer's perspective, if something happens to you while you're on stage and you're not so injured that you have to stop dancing, um, you have to make in the moment choices and it's your responsibility to stay true to what the choreographer's intentions were. Um, but sometimes you just aren't able to lift an arm or lift your leg the way that you're supposed to, or you can't jump the way that you have to. And so you have to really listen to your body in that moment and try your best to do what you have rehearsed to the best of your ability, but make those modifications enough for you to get through the rest of that piece. Um, there have been instances where I have had to modify things on stage um, that were planned, but um, I had a shoulder injury once and I was doing a, a piece that had a lot of uh, partnering work with like arms that go overhead um, and things that would pull off in a certain direction. And I had to, my partner and I had to reverse the entire pas de deux because I couldn't do things with one arm, but I could do them with the other arm. And in those instances, it's okay, but it's always really important that these directions to change the choreography come from either the choreographer or your artistic staff. Um, you can't, as a dancer, just make those decisions on your own. And um, I like how, thank you guys, that was a great conversation. I'm going to flip it to Dr. Papali to also talk about what we call in traditional sport return to play. Um, so coming out from an injury and then gradually working back in terms of return to dance. And I think all of you have sort of already hinted at this. You know, we've, we've talked a little bit about active recovery, right? That, that, that just sitting someone down and having them do nothing does not make a whole lot of sense for a variety of reasons. But once you've moved through this active recovery period, I guess this will be a question for, for everyone involved in this discussion, which is how do you then make that staged return back to uh, feeling performance ready? So what can you maybe what kind of physical benchmark are we looking to meet, but also uh, maybe how what effective tools have you seen in terms of how do you address the psychological component after you've been injured and then sort of making your return back? I think it has a lot to do with, well, first of all, it changes a lot from injury to injury, you know, because some injuries require a dancer to be back to a greater extent to actually be in the studio. But there are a lot of injuries that we can work around and help them back psychologically in the, in the studio and in the space. And sometimes I'll be like, okay, well, you know, for the first week or two, you're just gonna be learning in the back and doing as much as you can, I'll work you into the cast as we move forward. And I think making those kinds of um, accommodations can be very helpful, both physically and psychologically, um, because it, we talk, we've talked about it a little bit, but psychologically getting back into the studio, especially after a long injury, can be, can be challenging. And it feels good as a dancer to still feel valuable in the studio. So if you aren't allowed in the room at all, um, it can feel really hard and it can make you feel almost embarrassed for being injured um, to run into your peers and to talk about what's going on um, because you feel isolated. But um, being able to be involved to a certain degree, uh, like Russell was saying, in the back of the room is, is, is helpful psychologically to just feel like you are still needed in this company is still useful um, and still capable and that that your staff believes that you will be capable to do it. Heather, what kind of things are you looking for for uh, physical benchmarks? I mean, I think sometimes I get I guess one of the real values of having a, an on site physical therapist or an on site certified athletic trainer is that um, as Kathleen has dubbed you before, you end up sort of becoming the middleman and that transition back from maybe folks transitioning away from Dr. McKaylee saying, you know, this is an injury that's not necessarily compatible with a high level of performance. And then you're kind of that middleman to saying, okay, I think we're ready. So what kind of physical benchmarks are you looking for? And sort of how are you, how do you approach that repeat that transition period? Well, I think, you know, it obviously depends a lot on the injury and it comes a lot back to everything we've been saying with education and communication. But certainly there's healing times, right? So just because these are elite, incredible athletes that really understand their bodies doesn't mean they heal faster 
than someone who is sitting on their couch. So helping educate that there is an amount of time tissue has to go through healing and there's nothing anyone can do to rush that. And sometimes setting those expectations, both for the dancer and and for the artistic staff can be really helpful because it is almost a form of advocacy and take some of that responsibility and that embarrassment in a way off the dancer. Like you don't have a choice. I'm telling you, this is how it has to be because this is how it has to be. Um, and then certainly, you know, we have lots of screening tests and um, ways that we're evaluating strength and range of motion and function that I think can be encouraging and discouraging at the same time. You know, when dancers aren't meeting some of those benchmarks, they see, yeah, I'm not ready to go back. Um, you know, in my practice where, where we work, we really actually, our tests are harder than what they need to do sometimes. Um, you know, sometimes that's not the case because they're rehearsing six ballets at once and I, I can't make a test that's as hard as that in terms of endurance. But certainly there are things that I'm having dancers do as they're rehabbing that their healthy counterparts actually can't do. And so, you know, really encouraging them. And when they can do it, that sense of accomplishment gives them also the confidence to know, like, I can accomplish this really hard physical task. So actually getting in the studio is going to be a little easier for me. Um, and that's what our rehab is trying to do, is make sure that it feels a little easy when they get back to it. Um, there's always, always going to be that, that curve. And as Russell said, a lot of it can be also psychological. We're lucky that we work with a sports psychology practice. So when anyone, anyone does have um, an injury that's really going to take them out for a while, we always suggest that they um, meet with a sports psychologist and, and talk about how they're feeling and what they're going through um, and help that be important. Dr. McKaylee, what, what kinds of things, when you, if you're seeing a patient in follow-up, for example, what sort of things are you hoping to hear from a dancer or what sorts of tests are you are maybe you're doing with physical exam to, to have you feel confident that they're moving in the right direction? Well, I, I certainly think it's a very handy thing to know exactly what was causing them pain, what particular dance move, and then they can reproduce it for you. There was a time when we had what was called a transition class, which was, was uh, staffed by a physical therapist and a t dance teacher, and they would give us feedback. They would uh, they would give us feedback on exactly what the, how the dance was coming along and their return to full full class performance and 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 and, and uh, uh, capability, if you will. <clears throat> so I, I think that I, I really like to see a, a, a sense of tr progression. Uh, we might some of our dancers will see back on a weekly or even biweekly basis. And we want, we're hoping that we're getting feedback from the therapist and often the dance uh, teacher, they, how they did in class. Uh, I think that's, again, as a, we've seen it a number of times in the session, communication. And I, I think that sets up uh, Dr. Davenport pretty well for her next question about the sort of the interplay between maybe recovering those mechanics and the sort of the transition back to the artistry part of dance. Yeah, so as we're getting towards the of our time, we had a couple more questions. Um, so sometimes it can happen, at least in my dancers, when they're out from injury, we're so focused sometimes on the physicality. You know, we get a little bit overly focused, but physically focused, and then getting back. Now, any words, um, particularly from Mr. Kaiser and Ms. Fentroy, on getting back in terms of the artistry? So we've talked a lot about the in injury and the mechanics and rehabbing and staying strong, but then what about an artistry recovery? Can you speak a little bit about that? I'm gonna leave that one for you, Kirsten. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll, set, I'll set you up. I mean. Look, and again, it's, we're gonna go back to where you are in your career, right? Because a young dancer is gonna have a different journey back to that because they haven't even fully discovered it yet, perhaps. But um, a more experienced dancer, I think, and Kirsten should speak to this, I think it's a huge hurdle because you you spend a certain amount of time focusing so heavily on, on your injury and and getting to that point where you're not thinking about it anymore and you are just thinking about the artistry. 
I think that's a big hurdle for people to get over, especially for, you know, larger injuries. Yeah, I, I agree. It, it can be really hard to know that something could hurt or has hurt you in the past and to feel free in your movement, um, not limited by your mind and by your body. Um, but I think it goes back to, I, I tend to go back to when I was training um, or even still uh, as a working professional, the time that I feel my artistry is freest and when I feel the freest as an artist is when I don't have to think about my body. So that's when I trust my body is at its strongest. Um, it's when I know that I've put in the work and I know that my body will, will do the steps that I have asked it to do the way that I've asked it to do it for the most part. Um, and, and then my artistry can, can thrive on top of that. I can be free and my mind can be in the moment. I can be there to make the choices um, and not have to focus so much on, is my foot pointing? Is my arm in the right position? And things like that. Um, but it is really hard when you're coming back from an injury to not be caught up in what exactly your body is doing. And the last question to our artistic team here um, thank you all. Again, this has been so great. Um, I've enjoyed this thoroughly. Um, so a last kind of shout out, a little bit of an open question, talking about artistry recovery, because our main audience for this discussion is, you know, more of the healthcare professionals. And I think we talk a lot less between, I think, um, Southwick and Dr. McKayla can also probably nod to this. We talk a little bit less about an artistry recovery because we're very, we tend to focus on the physical recovery. So any last things that you would like to tell us from the medical perspective, specifically about an artistry recovery or anything that you would like to shout out and say, you have some brilliant minds out there. This is what I would love you to look at or study or research to help us stay safe and do our artistry. I personally wish that um, injury and mental health went hand in hand a little bit more, um, that that was a little bit more of a normal thing and not something for only the dancers that are either transitioning out of dance full time or are dealing with a long term injury or the dancers that seek it out on their own. I wish, uh, for example, if someone was out on uh, workers' comp case um, at, from a dance company that part of their requirements to fulfill their workers' comp needs would be to see uh, uh, someone for their mental health as well as their physical health because I think that that's so important and I also think that your mind has so much to do has so much healing energy uh, personally <laughs> um, and I think that it would just it would help dancers to get through the injury and to give your body the time that it needs um, to allow your body the time that it needs without your mental limitations. I agree with you. And I think it, it also will, will allow people to, to deal more upfront with the actual, what it's going to mean to recover, because it's different every time somebody comes back. For, for me and my role, it's about patience to get people back to that artistry. And, you know, I've recently worked with one of our dancers who was coming back from a long-term injury and the role he was getting into was really stressing his injury and it took a long time to get him there but it was it was it was worth the wait it was and i i think we might uh we're running right up against the end of our time here but just uh, out of the respect for folks watching on the facebook live stream if you are all okay with it for two more minutes i'd like to bring in one question from the facebook live stream that i think it's very uh apropos here this is uh joshua or Honrado, I'm sorry if I did not pronounce your name right, Joshua. He asks, um, and this is kind of a nice blend of a lot of what we talked about here at the end. He says, how have you successfully obtained company and stage manager buy-in in the question about the conversation of healthcare? So I guess, you know, we kind of all agree as a group of six that these are really important things, but how do, how do we get this to happen on the, um, the macroscopic level? Dr. McKaylee, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that is certainly a challenging question. I think that, uh, and it, it, one of my concerns over the last few years, having had the benefit of experience, is that the increased automation and to some extent depersonalization of healthcare 
is, is one of my great concerns. I think that uh, I can teach a, a, a trainee how to fix a knee surgically, especially with the new equipment and the newer techniques we have, which are often dramatic improvements for what we used to have. But how do you teach them to re realize that the patient is there because they're anxious, they, they have concerns about their their job, their, their family, and so forth and so on. How do you basically teach them that they have to provide empathy uh, for the patient? And uh, this is a very true, of course, in the artistic patient, but it's true in, in almost any patient. That it's one of our greatest challenges. We are spending so much time concentrating on the technical aspects, and particularly in the case of surgery, uh, that sometimes we, we miss the the importance of teaching them to be a, a good listener and a, and a compassionate person. You know, I, I, one of the things we've, our program has gone through different um, stages and changes sometimes, and we've tried to move with the times at Boston Ballet and really make sure we're a leader in healthcare and doing everything we can. And we've been really lucky to have Dr. McKaylee and an incredible team um, always guiding and helping us with that it really makes a difference like to have physicians and to have healthcare people that are passionate about dance. And I think that if you can show dance company that you're there for the right reasons and that you really care and, and can earn that trust. So by attending performances and learning about dance, um, engaging with the company, um, generally I think the reception is really good because then the company realizes that you are a person of trust and also somebody who really has passion for what the dancers do. And with a lot of the physicians that we work with, and I know Dr. McKaylee will attest to this, they're always amazed that these dancers are really like the thoroughbred of athletes. They're so much higher than their other professional athletes and really interesting. And so the physicians that have that passion and find that challenge, um, I think they, that kind of, we all come together that way and can work together to um, be part of the same, you know, we all have the same goal. We want to see these dancers dance. Yep. Man, I don't have anything to say after that. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you all again so much for being on this webinar. Uh, we're hoping that this will be sort of enduring material for iAdams on the iAdams website. And we're also having, hoping that this will be a launch pad for additional webinars um, from other companies around the United States to talk about, you know, sort of different issues and sort of how we how we educate others about dance medicine. So, again, thank you, thank you so so much for your time, and uh, hopefully we'll see see all of each other at the next live I <laughs> All right, guys. Have a good night. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thanks.